Uh, okay. Um, anybody seen Vic? Uh, we've got a bit of a technical problem here. Um, somebody's gone missing. So uh, I'm just going to hand over to the next reader. But I haven't got Vic's notes. So here we go. Some of you guessed it. <laughs> This is an excerpt from my novel, Fix Me Up. Um, in this scene, Colin, a Geordie heroin addict, has been arrested after an elderly woman that he's mugged has died. Um, so I'm just going to launch into it. They take me photo, put cotton buds in me gob, do fingerprints, keep us away from Leanne. When they lock us up, they say I can't wear me tracker bees. What are you on about? I'm raging. I'm not taking me pants off like. We'll get you another pair of pants to wear. The little last copper is calm, but that just makes the blood pound through us faster. We can't let you keep those on. Why not, like? They've got a cord in them, she shrugs. So? One of our mates jumps in, some old bloke with grey stubble and a big belly. Look, we're not letting you keep your tracksuit bottoms on. They've got a cord in them, and we're not getting in bother when you try and top yourself. So we can do this the easy way, or we can do it the hard way. Your choice. He stares down at us, hands on his hips. I just stare back. Someone hands him a placard bag. He opens it and holds some pants out to us. Nee way, I shout. I need bigger than them. No, you don't, Colin. He sounds bored now. Reminds us of the teachers at school. I, I do. I'm not wearing them. They'll be like budgies. A couple of them laugh and mutter, yeah, right, short arse. His hand doesn't move. He's still holding the pants in front of me face. Do you know how stupid you sound? This isn't a fucking fashion show, mate. It's me human rights. He rolls his eyes again. Give us a break, son. We're giving you the trousers. Put the buggers on. I'm not wearing ones that don't fucking fit, right? He sits down on the bench next to us and sighs. How tall are you, Colin? I shrug and look at the floor. Well, I'm six foot and you're a good few inches shorter than me. I'd peg you at around five, 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 six. Look at the guide here. It says someone your height should be in a medium, doesn't it? He's trying the nicey nicey act. Reminds us of one of my mum's boyfriends from when I was a kid. I just keep staring at the floor, grinding my teeth. Get is a large. They'll fall down, there's an out on you, man. He gives a little laugh, trying to be me pal. I'm not wearing them. You want me clothes? Go and get us a large. He sighs and smacks his legs as he stands up. He stuffs the pants back into the bag and hoys it at the lass. She comes back with a large. Colin won, pigs and out. The coppers introduce themselves when they switch on the tape recorder. One of them has the same surname as me. They don't waste any time like, get stuck straight in. One undoes his tie. The other one goes, Colin, we're just giving you the opportunity to clear your name here. If you didn't mug Mrs. Robson, Tell us where you were and what you were doing on the night she was attacked. That'll clear up any confusion and you'll be free to go. I can't help the smile twitching at me lips, just like I cannot stop me legs jiggling under the table. Nay, nee comment. If you keep saying no comment, Colin, and we charge you and it goes to trial, he looks at us like I know what he's trying to say. I don't. My forehead feels like it's going to burn through me skull. I want to ride me nails across it. I put my hands between my legs. The one with the same name as me clears his throat. What my, Colin mean, what my colleague means, Colin, is if you change your story in court, it won't be looked upon favourably when it comes to sentencing. So if you know anything, now's the time to speak up. The way he says anything makes us smile. He sounds as desperate as me looking for a hit. Me comment. All right, Colin, have it your way. The other one goes, hang on a second, John, before we let you go, Colin, why do you think we found Mary Robson's handbag in your backyard? He says it as though he cannot work it out himself. Sounds proper confused. I open my mouth, but now it comes out. I sit there doing that thing I used to do when I was a kid, pretending to be a fish. Jeff asked you a question, Colin. The smiles have gone now. They look at us and don't turn away. Their eyes are all slitty, jaws twitching. I think I can hear their teeth grinding. Then I realise it's mine I can hear. One rubs his chin. 
I think Mr. Smith must be shy all of a sudden, Jeff. Maybe we should give him another night in the cells to have a think about it. What do you think? Oh, I suspect he's going to have plenty nights to think about this one, John. The collector files and yank us to me feet. Oh dear, Jeff, it looks like Collins had a little accident there. He'll be stinking worse than usual by the time we get him in the morning. Just as well he got those large pants, John. He's still got room for when he shits himself. And that's it. <laughs> so I'm going to just crack on and put my presenter hat on. This is awkward. Um, thank you very much for your lovely comments. Right, now we've got that over and done with. Who's next? It is the lovely Lizzie Barber. Lizzie, bring some sanity back to this hellhole, will you? Lizzie was lovely to me when I was expecting my son and Teresa Talbot was lovely to me when I was worried about my son being poorly when he was a tiny baby. So it's a very lovely affair tonight. Anyway, Lizzie Barber studied English at Corpus Christ College, Cambridge. <laughs> Her debut novel, My Name is Anna, was the winner of the Daily Mail first novel competition ooh, and was published in, by Penguin Random House in January 2019. Lizzie is currently editing her second novel, which centres around a woman's nostalgic look back at a faithful summer in Italy and her inability to escape the past. So everybody, my friend, Lizzie Barber. Hello. Um, oh, this is very nerve-wracking. First of all, because I'm trying my best to do technology in that I'm the uh, novel I'm reading from, which Vic gave you a little bit of an excerpt from, uh, only exists on my laptop, which is also where I'm trying to now read it once. Um, I'm going to attempt my at this. Uh, so this is uh, my second novel, and uh, Lizzie, I'm really, I'm really sorry to talk over you. Have I got bad connection? We've lost you. Um, Simon, is it worth Ooh. trying without the video? Yeah, Lizzie, shall we try you without your video and we'll just hear your lovely dulcet tones? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> right, try again. That's better. Much better. Well, tell me. Stop me if it's not. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so there is this, uh, hopefully soon. I've been bad at it, so look out for it. Um, this is just being in from the very beginning of the book, and when I get to the beginning, before you judge me, remember this: a girl died. It was my fault. Lizzie, I'm so sorry. I know that's like professional. You can't hear me. Nah, you're breaking up. Um. We're going to try and come back to you later on, if that's okay, because okay. we're dying to hear from you. Um, I'm sure oh, Simon, I... Simon will be in touch to reach someone. Happy birthday, Newcastle Noir at the bar. <laughs> Who's next? Holly. Holly said <laughs> is up next. Um, right. Let's try this again. I believe Holly has got an exclusive for, the, for us this evening. So Holly Seddon is the international best-selling author of Try Not To Breathe, Don't Close Your Eyes and Love Will Tear Us Apart. Ooh. Her fourth book, The Wanted, will be published in early 2021. And I believe that's what Holly's reading from tonight. And I actually got a sneak peek of it and I start, started to read it last night. Um, Holly is co-host of the Honest Authors podcast along with Gillian McAllister. Holly actually lives in Amsterdam with her family. So everybody, huge round of applause for the lovely Holly Sutton. Holly, I'm loving your moustache. <laughs> right, that's Holly. Hi. Hi now. I'm being able to get to the waxes. <laughs> <laughs> so... This is my first time of reading from The Wanted. I've got really sweaty palms. <laughs> Hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, and also I have to remember there's some exclusive news at the end. So um, I'm not reading quite the beginning. What's just happened is Marianne, uh, the, the main character is a young widow and it's the anniversary of her late husband, Greg's death. She's in the early stages of a, a new relationship with Noah 
And in the abridged excerpt I'm about to read, she's just left Noah's house and returned to the East London flat that she shared with Greg. <clears throat> and I've got, I'm going to get a fit of the giggles or I'm going to cry, so I sort of apologise. Um, a little after seven, Marianne rattles the door key in the sticky lock and shoves her way into her hackney flat. After an empty night, it smells like the opposite of, de of life, not quite death, more like the blank space between the two. She pulls open Greg's side of the wardrobe and gingerly takes out his favourite shirt. Sliding it from the hanger, her eyes prickling. She grabs its fabric as though it's his flesh and sniffs it deeply, but there's no trace of him now, just the distant smell of whatever fabric conditioner was on special offer a year ago. It drapes over her as she slips it on, buttoning it carefully. He wasn't tall, but she's shrunk since then. She looks in the mirror and wonders what Greg would think if he were standing behind her now, that she's being indulgent, disrespectful. Her body is still scented from a night with another man. Or maybe like her, he would remember how they had been for most of their marriage until it all started to crumble at the very end. I love you, she imagines him saying. Always, she replies into the silence of the flat. Still wearing the shirt, Marianne struggles to push up the sash kitchen window high enough for her to lean out. The small galley looks out over a jigsaw of other people's yards, but she never sees a soul out there. She smokes fast and deep, blowing plumes across the would-be gardens and away into the scrubby trees. They had given up smoking together after they got married. And then a year ago today, she'd arrived at the hospital to be bustled into a small room with ridiculously floral sofa and no smoking signs everywhere she looked. Can I see him? She asked. There was a pause, an intake of air. I'm very sorry, the doctor began, holding her own hands together in a practice move. Marianne sat down hard on that ugly sofa, folded in on herself and barely took on a word. When she finally opened her eyes, all she could think was that she needed a cigarette. She smoked so much that first week that her fingers turned yellow and well-wishers held their breath when they hugged her. Her mother kept opening the windows, letting September winds blow through the flat so that scraps of paper with Greg's final words fluttered dangerously. Marianne had eventually slammed them shut, screaming God knows what at her mum, pointing to Greg's notepads and doodles, the little notes and receipts that had previously pissed her off as they clogged up the precious surface area of a bijou flat. Every artefact of life becomes sacrosanct in death. Forever means less to Marianne now, and she has no plan for it. She stubs out the cigarette on the concrete windowsill, a satisfying polka dot to add to the rest. She pushes the butt into the overflowing plant pot that she once intended to grow something in and tugs the window back down by its flaky frame. Marianne opens the bare fridge and then teases open the broken door to the freezer compartment, a small space she'd never really used it herself. It was only when the cover fell off uh, after a particularly hard slam of the fridge door that she saw inside. One piece of Greg's pie stuffed there one Monday long ago, some di distant afterthought. The pie is there still. She takes it out gingerly and holds it like a newborn, a solid proof of, piece of proof that he was here, alive once, caring enough to cook for them. Great family meals just for two. Tears fall as she switches the oven on, a musty smell filling the small room. She imagines Greg's voice. What are you doing to my kitchen? Sorry, Marianne whispers, but if I don't eat this soon, I'll have to throw it away. She defrosts the pie slowly in the microwave, no going back. You don't read about this and those leaflets about grief. When is the right time to take a new lover? And when is it okay to eat the last slice of pie? She lifts it carefully from the plastic tub, notices with a grimace that it's not just softened and defrosted, the edges have started to bubble. I'm sorry, she whispers again. It had always been a joke between them, how she was all thumbs in the kitchen. You could burn a boiled egg, he used to laugh. She smiles at the memory as she slides the pie on its baking tray into the oven. She hasn't eaten a proper meal at home in a long time. She tends to buy ready meals, order takeaways, or just skip food rather than bother with proper food. But this is different. She smokes another cigarette while the food cooks and then sets herself a place at the table. At first, it feels wrong to swallow, as if she's not eating the last remnants of a homemade pie, but something of Greg himself. It feels cannibalistic. But soon the familiar flavour and the softness of his pastry, missing for the last year, takes over her senses. She weeps as she swallows the final mouthful, the last of him gone. I miss you so much, she says to the empty plate. I just wish you were here every fucking day.
She looks at the pile of exercise books on the table and her school issued laptop, but she knows full well that no work will happen tonight. She's too full, too sad. Instead, she will do what she did on their wedding anniversary and Greg's birthday, what she did on those early widowed nights when the bed seemed so achingly cold and the nights so terribly long. And then later, when she needed to whip herself with memories, when the bed was still warm from the wrong body. Tonight, she will spend the night drowning herself with everything Greg left behind. That's my, I <laughs> got through it without crying. Um, so the news is that The Wanted was due to be published in February, 2021. <laughs> <a> drum roll. <laughs> Sorry, I think I'm losing the plot. Um, but the ebook is now going to be published on August 28th. So yeah. it's coming really, 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 really soon. And um, it doesn't ha have a final cover or anything. This is how, um, how sort of um, exciting it is. This has just been decided. So this is like a complete exclusive. Nobody knows this. Um, but you can pre-order it on Amazon if you would like to. So it's available there and now. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing your exciting news with us. That's fab. Um, yeah, so exciting. I think we're just going to pull another name out of the hat. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, I hope Amsterdam is not as wet and windy as Newcastle. It's my pal, Jane McAllister. Fantastic. <laughs> What are the odds? Um, Gillian McAllister is the Sunday Times top 10 best-selling author of five novels. Her latest is How to Disappear, coming next month, July 2020. Gillian is published in 11 languages ooh, and lives in the countryside with her boyfriend, cat and puppy. So everybody, huge round of applause for Gillian McAllister. Hi, just unmuting myself casually. I hope you can all hear me. I'm trialing using a proper microphone. Um, so this is my next novel, How to Disappear. It's out on July the 9th and it is a thriller set in witness protection. So my main character, Lauren, her 15 year old daughter witnesses the murder of a homeless man um, by a Premier League footballer and due to the nature of the trial when it collapses they are sent into witness protection to avoid the daughter being found and um, so it's called How to Disappear and it is out on July the 9th so I'm just going to read the prologue which is actually really short um, so Lauren ducks into the alleyway without warning she'll do it here before she goes inside she gets out the lipstick it's a nude shade she's worn for years her mirror is old too. Aidan bought it for the Christmas before last. She looks at it now, her initials inscribed on the back and opens it. One blue eye stares back at her. As she hides in the alleyway, she sees what she assumes is the candidate before her leaving the nursery. Oh no, Lauren thinks as she watches her go. The woman is wearing a skinny trouser suit, burgundy loafers, good hair. But more than that, she has confidence. It's everywhere in her walk, in the way she holds her handbag, dangling at the end of a slim arm. Her appearance is neat, whereas Lauren, looking back at herself in the mirror, is definitely messy. Her hair has frizzed in the rain around the temples. The woman glances briefly at her and Lauren shrinks further back into the alley. Don't look at me, don't speak to me. She stares out onto the rain slick street after the woman has gone. There are people coming and going in winter coats, Christmas shopping in their hands. It's late afternoon, already dark. The light from the shop fronts creates blurred sepia puddles of spilled light on the pavement. It is a totally normal street full of totally normal people, Lauren hopes. She looks again in the mirror and puts her lipstick on. It feathers at the edges and runs. She wipes around her mouth but smears it further, leaving her skin red and sore looking. What will they ask? Sweat gathers across her lower back. She doesn't know how to answer inter interview questions anymore. Not even the most basic ones. She gives up with the lipstick, closes the mirror and slides it back into her handbag. Inside the bag is a Portuguese custard tart from the bakery, which she will eat on the bus home. The paper bag spread across her lap to catch the crumbs. She's also saved a trashy article to read about two celebrities who are rumoured to be having an affair. Five minutes of guilty bliss just for her afterwards. What remains of her anyway? The handbag, the lipstick and the preference for custard tarts and celebrity gossip are old the parts of her that she has been permitted to keep, the parts of her that are left. She thinks of everything she can no longer do. Kiss her husband, post on Instagram, tell the truth. 
Lauren goes inside. The reception has wooden floors and a branded rug with the nursery's name on it. High trees. They're going to ask her competency questions, she is thinking, as the receptionist slides the glass screen back. Can I help, she says, and Lauren thinks, no, nobody can. Suddenly, I can't recall a time when I helped a difficult child to develop or I reported a safeguarding concern. Perhaps she can just tell them the truth, a half-truth, that she really, really needs this job, that she would be good at it, that she will love the children, that there is nothing better to her than seeing a three-year-old late talker say, Lauren, look, out of nowhere, as though somebody just turned on the speech part of their brain overnight. I have a 4.30 interview, Lauren says. As she speaks, she smells it. All nurseries smell the same. Poster paints, the plastic smell of lunch boxes, cucumber and bread. She blinks and glances around her. She is home, home amongst these smells and the little starfish hands and feet of the children she will fall in love with. Lauren forgets her frizzy hair, her smudge lipstick. Great, the woman says. Her nails click on the keyboard. Please, can you confirm your name? Leonora, Lauren replies. She glances at her reflection in the glass screen. There is no Lauren anymore. Lauren is gone. So that is my book, very obviously, about a woman who does not want to be in witness protection um, coming in July. So I hope you enjoyed it and thank you. Thank you so much, Gillian. That was fab. Excellent. OK, um, don't forget, chums, we've got the Q&A button here if you would like to ask questions for any of our authors this evening. Um, Lizzie Barber's back. We think we've got, got her sorted. So without further ado, the lovely Lizzie Barber. Okay, please tell me if this doesn't work again and I'll just toddle up and have a drink on my own. Uh, so this is my new novel. There should be an announcement coming about it soon. I haven't read it out loud to anybody, apart from myself a couple of times before this, uh, and only a couple of people have actually read it at all. So uh, please bear with me and I'm looking forward to hear what you think if I don't freeze. Before you judge me, remember this. A girl died and it wasn't my fault. I know that seems like a pathetic confessional, even more pathetic because the confession itself has, until this point, never been uttered. I've wanted to. Believe me, I have wanted to. The words have formed themselves on the precipice of my tongue, palpitating with their ugly need to be heard, to make me part of the narrative to declare to my A-level students when I see them coming up on their news feeds, languorously debating it now, once more, as it has risen into public consciousness 21 years after the fact. I was there. When they stumble in late to my lessons, eager to talk about the Trapasata Proximo, the mod about who fucked who last night at last night's social, and where the crimped hair is, really is making a comeback. I was there. When they blink at me from faces still etched with yesterday's makeup, reeking of the top shelf vodka and cigarettes that their house mistresses will studiously ignore, I was there. When they declare that they really struggled with this week's essay, so they only have notes, and about that C on their mock exam, did I know that their parents funded the library? And they don't even bother to wait for the responses. They pull out their laptops and glance at their watches, and they think to themselves, boring bitch has never lived. I was there. I imagine each letter incubating in the saliva that pours on the side of my gums. I picture myself standing, drawing the blinds, an illicit eyebrow raise that will make them pause, look up at me anew, place their laptop on the floor as I curl towards them. Screw Dante, let me tell you a real story about Florence. I'm just leaving for dinner when I hear. People talk of remembering exactly where they were when great events happened. Princess Di, the Twin Towers, Trump. I know this isn't quite on the same scale, but I'll remember exactly where I am all the same. I've had back-to-back -back lessons all day, but now, at last, I have an hour to myself, the only person left in the languages office. I've spent it working on a paper about Pirandello and the search for truth for the modern language review, barely coming up for air. This is the part of academia I enjoy the most, the research, the pulling together of an idea, rearranging words and thoughts on the page until they start to take on a life of their own, form arguments, cohesion. I'm hoping that this will be the one they'll finally agree to publish. I'm the only French and Italian teacher at Greybridge Hall, have been for the last 10 years. When they decided to introduce Italian at GCSE as well as A-level, I did suggest that perhaps now it would be time to look at hiring someone else. 
but Miss Greybridge, the eponymous head and third of that name to have held the position, reminded me that the school's ethos was personal and continuous care for every girl, which didn't really make sense as a rebuttal, but which I knew was shorthand for no, and which she knew because of the circumstances under which I assumed my position in the first place, I wouldn't argue with. Not that I don't enjoy teaching, sometimes. Shaping young minds and all that certainly seems like a worthy cause. When I was younger, much younger, I imagined maybe I would do a PhD, become a professor. I also thought about diplomatic service, traveling the world as a translator, journalism maybe. Instead, I'd sit through mock orals on topics as fascinating as food and eating out, cinema and TV, my family. My rumbling stomach is the first signal I've had that it is anything approaching evening. And when I tear myself away from my laptop screen to look at the darkening sky, I decide to sod my plan route around in the fridge and be sociable instead. Wednesday is quiz night at the pub near school. A, teacher's, a group of teachers go every week. The little thrill they get as their cerebral cortexes light up with the correct answer, just about making up for a day spent asking the girls to kindly not look at their Apple watches until break and maybe not take their makeup out of their designer handbags and cl until class is over just this once. I close down my laptop and do a brisk tidy of the room before slipping on my coat and scarf. I'm just about to slide my phone into my rucksack when an alert catches my eye. A name, bouncing out of the BBC News push notification that I have avoided all thought of for a long while, as much out of circumstance as as necessity. Sebastian Hale. I freeze in the doorway, phone clutched in my hand as preciously as though it were the Rosetta Stone, and look again not quite believing I saw it right. Presuming perhaps it was just wishful thinking, a long day of screen staring playing tricks on my eyes that could have conjured his name before me. But there it is, that name, those five syllables, the six vowels and seven consonants that have been more significant than any word or sentence written in my entire attempted academic career. And next to them, four words that throw my whole world out of kilter, that see me reaching for the door handle and wrenching it shut, all thoughts of dinner gone from my mind. Sebastian Hale, case to be overturned. I sit at my desk, lights off, face illuminated by the white glow of my phone screen, and read someone else's report of the story I know so well, the story I have lived. Overturned. I place the phone down on my desk, snuffing out its light, and press my palms into the woodwork. The feel of my flesh rubbing against the desk's smooth surface grounds me, helps me process the report. Think. I knew there had been requests for appeals over the years, all denied. Rejections from the court of re-examination, a change of lawyer, probably hoping that new eyes on the case would find something that was missed, but they've all come to nothing. If he is retried, if there is any possibility that he might be released, that would, everything would change. After that initial trial, after my part was done and I could finally go home and resume the life I had worked so hard to live, I tried, I really truly tried to put it behind me. That was what she did after all. And I wanted to follow her lead. I have always wanted to follow her lead. But that time has never truly left me. Sometimes it will take the smallest thing, the light filtering through a window just so, a particular kind of humid heat, walking past a patisserie and being hit with a waft of baked vanilla sweetness. And it all comes back to me with cut glass clarity. The sound of our laughter ricocheting off ochre colored walls, the clink of glasses and taste of hot weather raw red wine, the touch of sweat dewed skin, the scent of pine, the giddy delightful feeling of being young and happy and having the rest of our lives spooling out in front of us. These are the good things, the things I want to remember, the bad things, those I have no choice but to remember. And now, at the sight of his name alone, I am instantly transported, flying on the wings of a deep deja vu, away from that cold late autumn day and dusty corners of my tired office and back, back, back to that time, that summer. To those gold-tinged days and months that crescendo spoke so spectacularly into those final onyx hours. To the start. Thanks, Vic. Thank you so much, Lizzie. Do you want to tell everyone why you were having connection problems? Uh, yeah, because my husband was downloading video games. No, I, I mean, shouted at, no. 
<laughs> it was the Bourne Supremacy. Ah, okay, it was a film. Well, that makes it better. Um, Amy Tunstall would like to know, what is this book called and when will I be able to pre-order it? Oh, thank you, Amy. Um, it is a working title at the moment, um, so I don't think I can reveal it. Oh. And I will also not be able to reveal, this is awful, I also won't be able to reveal when you can pre-order it, but follow me on Twitter at by Lizzie Barber, um, also on Instagram, um, and hopefully you will have some news very soon. I'm sorry, I can't say any more about that. Oh, it's lovely that you've been able to read your exclusive piece for us anyway. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we are going to go to another break. Simon, I believe we have some more readings. Is that right? Yeah. So, Noir from the Bar, our charity anthology, is out on the 10th of June. Here are some readings to whet your appetite. Hi, my name's Graham Smith, and I'm going to be reading a short extract from my story from Noir from the Bar, uh, which is called the, the Smell of Perfume. So, here goes. I was heading towards my usual haunt, Jimmy's. It'd be open soon, and I planned to spend the day ambushing Jack Daniels. Once I'd ambushed him, I was going to surround him until his fiery tongue leached through my stomach and into my nervous system. When his retaliation captured me from within, I could relax as he chased the ghost of my past out of my head and halfway down the street. Thank you very much for listening and supporting a great cause. Arthur Brock sat in his shed, reading a copy of Val McDermott's Forensics, The Anatomy of a Crime. It was another secret pleasure he'd developed since he met Ethel. She was something of an expert on crime fiction and had been educating him in the art of tartan noir. He was up to chapter five, toxicology. That's what gave him the idea. Not that he was blaming Val, mind. His wife, Jessie, was severely allergic to penicillin, but how could he do it and not get caught? He wasn't likely to be able to get hold of drugs, not at his age and without a prescription. I'm not a bad man, he thought. I don't want to cause her unnecessary pain, but I'm at the end of me tether. It'll be one of those mercy killings like you read about in the Gazette. You can find out what happens next in the Limburger killing, a virtual noir short, out on June the 10th. Despite the fading camera stickers in the window proclaiming it a home to real ale, I doubt the fire station would feature in many best pub guides. I can't see any reason for the name. Externally, it looks like a typical Pebble Dash 60s build. Internally, as I enter on a cold Saturday night in February, I can't see any firefighting memorabilia or pictures of relevance on the wall. What I see is a bog standard, frayed at the seams, edge of town pub consisting of a saloon bar and a lounge. Neither one better than the other, I'm sure. What I also see is an empty pool table, an unoccupied dartboard, and a fruit machine being fed, almost trance-like by an old man who looks as if he needs a win on the machine or life. I see a dozen or so tables, only a quarter of them occupied, all by hard-faced middle-aged patrons. I see all this in a sweep of the precedent in mere seconds, because suddenly my undivided attention is on the man sitting on the furthest of the four stools at the bar, the man responsible for my daughter's death.
Hi, I'm Roz, and this is the uh, very beginning of Tiger's Eye View. Its name translated to Tiger's Eye View, and it was the most stunning place in the whole of the Himalayas, or so said the whispers of the grubby travellers in the backpackers' lodges. It was incredibly difficult to find, and the guides refused to take tourists there, but wouldn't explain why. Of course, that had made me desperate to go which is why I'd volunteered to stand in for the unwell friend of some bloke I'd met last week in a bar who'd managed to persuade an unofficial guide to take him. After several beers, it felt like a reasonable thing to do. It was a three-day trek to get there, just me and the bloke, whose name was Gus and who kept knocking into my rucksack, and the guide, Yash, a man of few words, whose natural walking pace was that of a startled goat. We'd been going for two and a half days and were now so far from the tourist trail that I felt half euphoric, half nervous. Johnny, the bellboy, was walking the guest's dogs along the front. It was early. From a distance, he thought the body at the water's edge was a tramp. War heroes and misfits came down from London and slept under the pier, ragged, damaged men. A black miniature poodle, the unlikely leader of the pack, barked and pulled in the direction of the girl's corpse. Recognition lit Johnny's eyes and he hauled the dogs up the beach, running towards the entrance of the Imperial Hotel. Inside, the grand hallway was deserted. Mr. Prentice, Johnny panted at the night manager, who was reading behind the mahogany reception. A pot planted with a palm partially obscured Prentice's view of the bellboy, not that he bothered to raise his eyes. Then dogs need a proper run, he said. You ain't been out long enough. I remember to come back. Great. Okay, don't forget Q&A. If you want to ask anybody some que a question, please do. If you want to donate to our bar, the money doesn't come to me and Simon, by the way. I would have been long gone with it by now, if I'm honest. Um, the money goes to keeping the lights on and anything else will go to the NHS because they're fab. If you want to enter the free book competition, just email this with the subject, happy birthday, because it's more at the Barney Castle's fourth birthday today. I'm spending far too much time with a child on. I'm sorry to patronise you all. Anyway, so our next reader is Chris MacDonald. The lovely Chris MacDonald is a Northern Irish author who is currently based in Manchester. A Wash of Black is his first book. He came up with the initial idea during a night feed. We've all been there, or I certainly have, which might not be the best thing to admit. Considering the content of the story, Whispers in the Dark, the second in the D.I. Erica Piper series, will be published by Red Dog Press in November. Chris, along with Rob Parker and Sean Coleman, is also a host of Blood Brothers podcast. So again, this is a podcast I mention most weeks. And um, please, please, please do listen to it. Um, it's just so much good fun. Anyway, Chris MacDonald. Well, um, the uh, so I'm, just, I'm right. I'm reading from the first chapter of A Wash of Black, which is my only book. Um, the I it's written in first person, so um, you have to imagine me as a woman, which might not be too difficult. Um, so Liam and I cross the foyer and push open the double doors into the ice rink. A frigid blast of ice biting at the small amount of skin, foolish enough to be left exposed. We walk towards the rink perched on the barrier between solid floor and ice, and survey the scene. I should have said at the start, it might be a little bit gory, um, so, yeah. <laughs> a shudder courses through my body, which has nothing to do with the cold. 
I'm used to seeing what the worst of humanity is capable of, but sometimes the sheer brutality of it all takes me by surprise. I realize my hand has subconsciously covered my stomach. In the middle of the ice lie the remains of a woman. She may have been beautiful once, but no longer in death. Serrated blades hold her long limbs tight to the ice. Her head is angled, as if searching for an impossible escape. A gaping black hole swirls where her neck once was. On the other side of the rink, a broken door leading to the street is at the mercy of the wind. Police tape has been rolled across it at waist height, and a uniformed officer has been handed the short straw, tasked with keeping vigil just outside in the pouring rain. John Corain is the forensic pathologist present at the scene, the best the city of Manchester has to offer. He is perhaps the thinnest man I've ever seen, as if his appetite is limited by the grisly nature of his job. Understandable, really. From under his hairnet, tight rings of short ginger hair curl around the, links, the legs of his glasses, securing them steadfastly in place. His spindly fingers hold a recorder to his lips, and he speaks into it at regular intervals when he spots something of note. He glances towards us and raises a hand in recognition. Erica, give me two minutes and I'll be with you, he shouts, his voice echoing around us. We watch him go about his work before clicking off his recording device and walking over the metal stepping plates towards us. Erica, fantastic to see you, he says. You're back for good now? Yep, I nod, I'm fit as a fiddle. I'm so glad, he beams. Horrible business. He shakes his head, clears the emotion away. Martin has done all he can on the ice, he says, looking over my shoulder at the head scene of crime officer. He puts his hand in the air to attract Martin's attention. I'll just talk them through the body and then it's all yours, he calls. Shall we? asks John. Liam and I step over the metal stepping plates and advance towards the body. The scene is a mess, so much blood. The crimson liquid has pooled underneath her body where the knives were plunged into her arms and legs. It has seeped slowly across the slick, icy surface from the same wounds. Unusually, the blood from her jagged throat laceration has all spilled in the same direction. Most of it has crept a little way from her neck, while some has spurred at quite a distance across the ice. The dead woman is wearing a, a blue skinny jeans, a yellow halter neck top, and black stiletto boots. A thin gold chain sits mournfully on her chest. On her left hand, she wears an engagement ring with a cluster of diamonds. Undoubtedly a homicide, John states. Won't know for certain cause of death until I get her on the slab, but I'd hedge my bets on exsanguination, blood loss from the throat. I lean in for a closer look. You'll notice that the blood from the throat is sprayed in one direction, he continues. Usually, you'd expect to see the blood spatter in an arc. He moves his hand in a slow, semicircular motion to compound his point. Has something stopped her from moving? Liam interrupts. Someone, he replies. If you look here, he motions to the left side of her face, you'll see a faint soul print. I close my eyes and picture the scene. The killer pins his poor girl down with the steel blades and stands over her. He lifts his boot and presses it onto the side of her face, pushing it down onto the ice. He cuts her throat and keeps his weight in her cheek, ensuring the blood doesn't spray his way. John's voice stirs me from my thoughts. Her tongue has been cut out too. You know, it's not the first time she's died like that, says Liam, suddenly. John and I look at each other confused, then back to Liam. What do you mean? You really do not appreciate popular culture, do you? Don't you recognise her? I study her face. I thought it looked familiar, but I can't place it. What do you mean about dying the same way twice? It's Anna Simons, the actor, he says. She was in a film where she was killed just like this. Knives through the arms and legs, throat cut. Her tongue wasn't removed as far as I can remember, though she was naked in the film, so my attention could have been elsewhere. First of all, I say, you are gross. He sticks his tongue out at me. Secondly, why didn't you leak with this information? Well, he says, John was on a roll and I didn't want to interrupt. Fair play, I say. What was the name of the film? No idea. Came out a few years ago. Odd. I think. So the killer has recreated a scene from a film, but made changes. And if the film came out years ago, why now? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, 
We've had a question from Alex Hawley asking if there'll be an audio version of Noir from the Ball. Now, at the moment, we don't have an audio version lined up, but you have had a very special guest read an extract of your story, haven't you? I have, yeah. Yeah, so um, Frank Turner, who is a singer um, that I've loved for years and years, um, agreed to read 30 or 40 seconds of my story. So uh, I think in the grand scheme of things, that's one of the biggest things that's happened <laughs> in my writing life. And where can we see said video? I put it on my Twitter earlier, um, so and I'm sure you can share it. I'm at CMAC Writes Crime, so if you want to find me there. Excellent, thank you. And um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about the Blood Brothers podcast, how it came about and how we can get involved? Should we want to become a guest, for example? Yes, and there are so many people on here tonight that I'd really love, so um, the readings have been awesome. Um, yeah, Sean Coleman, who's my publisher, um, uh, got in touch and said that I want to be on this podcast uh, with Rob Parker as well. Um, so I feel very lucky to be there every week. And um, yeah, I've had sort of, I've met heroes already and we're only, I think, 10 weeks in. I think yours at last count, Vic, because Vic came on, I think, week five or six. And I think yours is still the most listened to podcast. No way. People love you. <laughs> oh, my God. That's such a joke. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, we talk about crime. It's very, very informal. Um, we, we record on Sundays. comes out Thursday. Tomorrow, we've got Chris Whitaker, um, who wrote oh. We Begin at the End, which is just stunning. Oh, fabulous. Um, and so how would anyone get onto the podcast should they wish to just tap you Chris or Sean yeah no. I, I usually come and beg people uh, on Twitter to come on so um anybody here that wants to um if you follow me or if not come and follow me and then I'll uh, get in touch yeah it'd be awesome to have any of any of the people here tonight on anybody get in touch it's such good fun honestly I loved my uh, stint so thank you very much for hosting me Chris and thank you for your fab reading Okie dokie. Right, um, our penultimate reader this evening, who will it be? Ah, it's on the floor. It happens every week. Baby lock. Every week that hat ends up on the floor. It's got its own chair and everything. It still prefers the floor. Phoebe Locke is the pseudonym of Nikki Cloak. I hope I've got that right. She's written seven novels, both for adults and young adults, and her most recent thriller, The July Girls, was published last summer. Phoebe also works at the Faber Academy. So everybody, please welcome Phoebe Locke. Oh God, so such a lovely time listening to everybody else. I forgot I was actually reading. <laughs> Um, I'm going to read from The July Girls, which, as Vic said, came out last summer in July after some discussion. Um, the main premise of the novel is that on the same night every year in July, a woman is taken from the streets of London by a killer who, despite their best efforts, the police cannot find. Our main character, Addie, who may or may not have a personal connection to that killer, is nine when the novel opens. Um, she's living in a flat in Brixton with her dad and with her older sister, Jessie. Jessie is, she's kind of the mother figure in Addie's life. Addie's actual mother left as a baby um, when she was a baby. And her, their father is largely absent. He is a minicab driver. He's actually recently lost his license, so he's working illegally, so he's rarely there. He's this kind of half scary, half loving figure in the flat who they both do their best to tiptoe around and avoid. Um, and in this scene, I'm gonna read for you, it's Addie's 10th birthday, the date of which is the 7th of July, 2005, which of course is also the date of the London bombings. Um, Addie is absolutely terrified when Jessie fails to pick her up at the school gates as she promised. She's even more scared when she gets home and finds that Jessie isn't in the flat either, and neither is their father. So Addie's just spent this horrible night wondering where her sister is and what might have happened to her. She's fallen asleep on the sofa on her own and we'll pick up there. The sound of a key turning in the front door woke me. I sat up, Jessie's favourite scarf, which I'd wrapped myself in, slithering to the floor. It was pitch black, the TV off. The door closed quietly and a breath of night air and smoke floated into me. 
Jesse, I called, but there was no answer. I stood up and wobbled over to the doorway, eyes still sticky with sleep and the fear growing again in my belly. But it was Dad standing in the hallway, one hand still on the door. We blinked at each other, neither of us moving. Hey, birthday girl, he said eventually, his voice coming out low and croaky. What are you doing? I was sleeping, I said, tears turning the words gluey and thick. I was scared. I was too tired and confused to think about whether I'd be getting Jessie in trouble. The realisation that she still hadn't come home, dawning and drowning everything else out. Dad, I said, starting to cry now. The bombs! But he was already pushing past me into his bedroom. The smoky night smell and a faint trace of something ranker going with him. He didn't turn the light on or turn round as I followed him. Dad, Jessie, I tried, and that did get his attention. His face was pale in the dark as he turned to look at me. She's not here. He was pushing his shoe off with the toes of the other, stooping to remove the second one. When I shook my head, he swore and fished his phone out of his pocket. She didn't answer. I watched him throw the phone down on his bed as he pulled off his t-shirt. I'm getting in the shower, he said, his voice tight. You need to go to bed, okay? It's late. Before I could say anything, he'd moved past me and into the bathroom the door closing in my face and just that same strange coppery smell left behind. I usually did whatever he told me, but instead I curled up on his bed and listened to the water patter into the shower tray, willing his phone to ring from the foot of the bed. She would be sorry and he would be angry, but everything would be okay again. That clenching feeling in my chest would go away and everything would be okay. I could hear the furious frothing of him washing his hair in there, and I pulled his t-shirt closer to me, wanting to breathe him in. The warm, muggy, dad smell that I knew, and not that dark, meaty scent he'd brought in with him. I lay back against his pillow, his t-shirt against my cheek, and fiddled with the hem of it, the way I did with my baby blanket when I was little, until Jesse had told me it was time to put it away. My fingers touched a dry patch along the bottom of the t-shirt, a place where the fabric was stiff, I looked down, three roundish marks, one large, two small, dark, red dried to rust, blood. The water stopped running. I heard the curtains swoosh back, the wet plastic slap against the wall. The toilet flushed. I looked at the three spots. He came out of the bathroom with a towel around his waist and finally flicked the light on. Did you hurt yourself? I asked. And he frowned. When he saw the top in my hands, the stained part held out to him. His face went taut. I saw a scratch on one of his cheeks, red and angry. Was it the bombs? I asked, starting to cry properly this time. Dad, was it the bombs? What? He came and sat down on the bed beside me, took the t-shirt from me. Is that what you're worried about? I was nowhere near the bloody bombs. Jesse won't have been either. Oh, I tried to wipe my nose on the back of my hand, tried to swallow back my tears. He never liked it when we cried. But that night he just reached for his phone and checked it, then spun it round to show me a text. Jessica, sorry, on way home now. There were scratches on his arm, two raked lines near his wrist. And what happened to you? There was a fight, he said. Two lads against another outside some club. I tried to break it up. They were really giving him a kicking. We looked at each other. My mouth had turned dry again. Okay, he said. Get into bed, Addy. It's really late. His watch was next to me on the bedside table. Its face read 3.01 a.m. There were drying red flecks on the glass. He picked up his phone again and left the room. I heard him filling the kettle, heard the pops as he pierced the plastic on a microwave lasagna. And in the bathroom, I found what I was looking for. Balled up behind the toilet, smelling of that strange metal smell and sodden in my hands. His black jeans, my hands coming away red. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Phoebe. I really loved reading the July Girls. 
last summer. So um, for those of you who haven't, get on it right now. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, okay, we do just have one last, one name in the hat. There it goes on the floor. Fantastic. It's Danny Marshall. Poor Danny Marshall. <laughs> he has read for us before. Um, he's our first returner to Virtual Noir at the Bar. The last time, the foolish host got his name wrong and his internet was less than cooperative. So we're hoping that tonight it will go better for him. I shall certainly try to remember my own friend's name. So Danny Marshall was born and raised in Halifax, West Yorkshire. Just a quick note about Danny Marshall. He is appearing in our Noir From the Bar anthology. And if nothing else, you're going to want to read his bio in it. So pre-order it now. Born and raised in Halifax, West Yorkshire. In 2016, he had a short story published in New Right North's Northern Crime One compendium. And later that year, he was selected to pitch at Bloody Scotland. Ooh. He won a Northern Writers Award in 2018 for his novel, Anthrax Island. Ooh. And signed with an agency last year. Ooh. With that first novel out on submission, a few weeks ago, um, Danny read from his work in progress, bank heist serial killer thriller, Down in the Park. And Danny did is actually responsible for our um, quote of the week game, because I believe the quote that week was, fuck your Maltesers. So I'm really excited to see what, what the quote is this week. Everybody, Danny Marshall. Oh, way to big me up. Let's see if you can get any quotes. Thanks, Vic. Happy birthday, Noir at the Bar. Hopefully my internet holds out this time. Yeah, this is my second visit. Um, the last time I read from that thriller that I'd literally just sent my agent and that was fun, but I'm really pleased to have another go. Um, so as Vic said, I've got a short story included in the anthology. So I thought I'd read a short story. Um, I reworked an older story for the anthology that I'd written a few years ago and I finished it and I was about to send it off and then I changed my mind and decided to write an, a brand new story for the anthology instead because I wanted to do a, a locked room murder mystery for it. So I did that. <coughs> I was going to read that for you tonight but it's a little bit too long so you're gonna have to buy the anthology. Instead I'm going to read you that first story that didn't make it in so that at least it gets an airing. It's very horror influenced, it's inspired by 80s slashers, it's standard horror film stuff, it's a uh, victim trying to escape a stalking killer through a house and like all good 80s video nasties it's rated R for a little bit of swearing and some violence. It's called I Survived. <clears throat> That's not really a spoiler since I'm now writing about the most terrifying night of my life. My therapist told me to do a journal, she says it'll help me get perspective She'll never read it, but she reckons just getting things out of my head and down onto paper is a great coping mechanism. Anyway, I'll kick off with me hiding behind the shower curtain. It's cliche, I know, but bear with. I was at Laurie's place in a bathroom and I wasn't alone in the house. Footsteps creaked down the hallway, only it wasn't Laurie. I knew that for a fact because the last time I'd seen her, she'd been lying on the bedroom floor with a bloody great kitchen knife sticking out of her neck. Since we'd been disturbed in the middle of enjoying ourselves, I were naked, vulnerable. The footsteps crept closer. He was taking his time, relishing the hunt. I watch a lot of horror films. I know what you're thinking. Why are you hiding in the bath? It's the first place he'll look. Maybe, but trust me, in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere, bollock naked with no weapons, you'd do the same. The timbers groaned. His breaths came deep and hoarse. I shrank back against the tiles with the music from Psycho stuck in my head. I thought back to the newspaper on Laurie's coffee table, specifically the headline that had knocked the Falklands off the front page, locally at least. Masked serial killer stalks Halifax. It were only last year Sutcliffe was sent down, and now everyone were talking about this, with the papers blaming everything from video nasties to Nintendo. Made for great news. Not so great to be on the receiving end. I had no intention of ending up dead. Next door had buggered off to Costa Brava, nearest civilization were a pub down the lane, the slaughtered lamb, so it was just me and him. I slowly pushed my head round the plastic curtain. I could see the empty landing, stairs leading down to freedom. Maybe the video nasties got it wrong, the shower weren't the first place he looked. A crash echoed around the house. He was in the spare room, looking for me, and it was a chance I needed. I crept along the landing, sweeping up my jeans, 
Down the stairs, another smash, masking my steps as I grabbed the rest of the clothes that I'd discarded on the way up to the bedroom earlier. Wood splintered as he continued taking his rage out on the furniture. I ran to the front door and locked. I looked for the key, couldn't find it. More banging upstairs, screaming now too. Into the kitchen, I dropped my clothes to the floor, pulled my jeans on. As I did, I glanced at the novelty Garfield phone, its curly wire tail trailing down the wall. But I knew the line were dead. It was the first thing I'd checked. I told you, I do watch a lot of horror films. I could still smell the pre-pub bolognese that Laurie had cooked earlier. Plates and cutlery next at sink, a couple of baby sham bottles, banal reminders of normality. The house didn't care that there were a serial killer on loose. I pulled my t-shirt over my head and just like that, I didn't feel quite so vulnerable, which is good because the footsteps were coming again. I looked at the back door in the garden. The garden was safety. Where the hell were the keys? I patted my jeans, felt my own car keys. I'd left the Capri down the pub. A 10 minute drunken stagger, but at least it gave me something to aim for. The noises were amplified in the darkness, the stairs protesting under someone much bigger and scarier than me. I poked my head round the kitchen door, filthy boot descended, followed by workman's trousers, dark overalls. I looked at my trainers on the mat, too late, nowhere to go. I slid off the floor onto the worktop, squashing up behind the door. The sounds dragged closer, agonisingly slowly. Finally, he stood in the doorway, a nightmare shadow, stretched across the tiles, long legs and wide body, bending up the cupboards. I held my breath. He didn't. I could hear him rasping on the other side of the door, just an inch of plywood separating us. A blade appeared round the door, faint red smear streaked the wood. The knife that had killed Laurie. What an idiot I was, ignoring horror rule number one, grab a weapon. The knife block was at the other end of the kitchen, well out of reach. He lurched in. I pulled my knees right up under my chin, looking at the back of his head, his lank mullet, huge shoulders, huge knife. He took another step forward, sniffing the air, feral. The blade flashed centimetres from my toes. I was fucked. Any second now he'd turn and see me cowering behind the door, so I made a snap decision that saved my life. I straightened my leg, foot out, one fluid motion, heel outstretched. I got him right at the base of his big granite skull, that pit where your spine goes up into your brain. He flew at the door, arms out, and unfortunately for him it glazed. His arms disappeared with a smash. He staggered, swayed. I jumped down and kicked his belly, slumped with a growl, legs thrashing. I backed away, feeling for the doorway, my slim advantage already evaporating. I ran blindly into the dining room, where thin curtains billowed across a carpet littered with broken glass. Classic horror film entry point. I looked at the jagged edges round the frame, it'd have to do. I dived through, slicing myself in my haste, but at least I was out in the sticky summer night. The grass was damp with morning dew. I looked over at the woods I knew so well. Normally I'd be able to lose someone in there, but not in the dark and especially not without shoes. A crash of glass on tiles pulled my eyes to the back door. No shape, thin trickles of blood on the door frame, all that remained. I sprinted round the side of the house, down the lane, heading for safety. My feet slapping worn cobbles as I ran across the front of the house. As I approached the front door, an alarm triggered in my mind, something amiss. Too late, I registered the black space where the door should have been. He launched from the open doorway, shining teeth, furious snarl. We collided, crashing to the ground, rolling into the damp weeds. Getting to the car were an option. I needed to finish it. I swung my right arm up. His nose exploded against my elbow. I tried to throw my left arm, but for some reason it refused to move. He pulled his hands to his face, blood streaming between his fingers, mingling with the blood from his torn wrists dripping onto my chest. I tried to move, but he pushed his weight down. I strained, my arm refused to move. I turned my head and cried in pain. The kitchen knife was embedded in my shoulder. He grinned, teeth glowing in the moonlight as he panted like an animal. Fat fingers encircled my throat. I struggled, but it was too big, too powerful. His teeth stopped glowing, my vision dimmed. The world gained a fuzzy border, creeping in until all I could see was that grin. I had seconds left. I reached across the chair, my chest, gripped the handle of the kitchen knife, still embedded in my shoulder. He either didn't notice or didn't care. In one movement, I slid it out, pulled it down to my stomach and thrust upwards. I twisted. The effect was instantaneous. He roared, rolling away, clutching between his legs as if that had reattached things. I climbed on top, bringing the knife in hard against his neck. 
I knelt on top of him, catching my breath as he spluttered, losing his. I yanked the knife back out of his neck and watched his life pump out in little rivers between the cobbles. I closed my eyes, breathing deeply for what seemed like ages. When I opened them, the sky seemed brighter. Night had lost. Trees were full of song. The air was thick with that warm, damp smell of a summer dawn. I survived. I looked down at the body. Didn't recognise him from round here, which is really odd, because I've been watching Laurie's house from the woods most of the day, just like all the others, nice and remote, easily cut phone lines, no neighbours to hear the screams. I pulled off my Thatcher mask and let it drop to the cobbles. He must have been the boyfriend that I'd overheard her talking about in the pub. Probably worked shifts or something. He'd returned before I could finish with Laurie. As I collected my shoes and wiped the place down, I decided this was a good thing. I'd taken on this monster and I'd won, and if I can do that, I can do anything. Thanks, therapist. This is really, really is helping me get perspective. I might branch out to an old family when my arm's feeling better. Sleep tight. Back to you, Vic. Thank you so much, Danny. We've got now several contenders for quote of the week. I thought I was going uncontested, but you know, whatever. Um, so if you like Danny's short story, which was amazing, um, that's the one that he didn't send for Noir from the Bar. He's got a better story than that. So you definitely want to pre-order it. Okay. Um, go on Twitter. I'll be uploading your quote of the week options very, very shortly at our um, Twitter account at vnatb1. <sighs> Just remember all this stuff back here. Thank you very much for all of you joining us tonight. Thank you for being with us in Newcastle for four years and for being in the virtual bar for 10 weeks now. And um, we will be back next week. So keep your eyes on your inboxes to find out who's coming up next. Um, thank you very much to Simon Buick for being amazing as always. And to the writers who've given up all their time to be involved. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, and we will see you next Wednesday at half past seven. Thank you.